and welcome to Rappin' with Reverend Laura, the new revised version. Um, and I am in my home on a snow day with my husband, Scott. Hello. And um, as uh, I said when I interviewed my kids, the best place to start when you're trying a new thing is to try it out on your family because they're, you know, willing victims. So uh, um, the Reverend Dr. Scott McLeod is... Um, uh, I asked him to talk a little bit about his interest, which is church history. <laughs> Pardon me. I'm feeling a little tired already. So, uh, <laughs> seriously, he's very smart about that stuff. And so I thought he could tell us a little bit about it. So, um, you, you've re- made notes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so this isn't a, this isn't a uh, classroom. So we're, we're just telling you, uh, you're just going to get to know you a little bit and about, so how, do, what, why is history so interesting to you and church history, the boringest of histories <laughs> in particular? <laughs> uh, with that kind of a setup. Right. Um, so I, I, I was thinking about it and again, Laura asked me like, what would I want to talk about? And, you know, like. Uh, but church history did come up, and it is one of the things that I um, do enjoy and have a strange um, obsession with. Um, I really, you know, getting a, a new book um, from Amazon in the mail just today is like my, like... Is it a church history book? It is. Where is it? Do you have show and tell? It's right here. What's it called? It's called... American Covenant, a history of civil religion from the Puritans to the present. Wow. Yeah, doesn't that sound awesome? Mm -hmm. Well, see, and... No, it doesn't, but... (laughs) No, it does. It sounds awesome. And and it's actually, this is, because this is the paper... um, Back version. Paperback version. um, It has a new introduction from the author talking about the current time. That we're in, oh. and 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 a response to Trumpism, and about how uh, civil religion offers one kind of like as an alternative to some of the Christian white supremacy kind huh. of kind of issues that are out there. So it's it's actually quite relevant, I think. Okay. But so, um, what does history have to do with anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I see. I grew up in Connecticut. Um, and in Connecticut, uh, we, we lived in Tolland and, uh, Tolland is surrounded by lots of woods and forests. And I used to love exploring Mm -hmm. and you'd come in the middle of these deep, thick woods. Suddenly you'd come across a stone wall. And I always thought it was really bizarre. Like who would build a stone wall in the middle of the forest? Like what a strange, like, why would you build a stone wall in the middle of the woods? And it, you know, it took me, a, you know, longer than it should have probably, <laughs> but to realize that when they built those stone walls, it wasn't a forest. Um, when they built those stone walls, it was farmland and it's just, it hasn't been used for farmland for a hundred years. Oh. And it kind of just, it, that, that kind of understanding that like, you know, where I'm standing, mm-hmm. you know, has a history much bigger than me and much longer and that things have that the that the present that I know is very different from what has come before right and that the future may be just as different or even more different mm-hmm. than where we are right now that's always kind of uh, fascinated me and uh, so part of my love of history is kind of figuring out the story of how we got today you know how we got Mm -hmm. here today and um i think i've I've always loved history but my love of history has grown in the last 25 or 30 years Mm -hmm. um and a lot and some of it came because i went to a the the church that i came to in elkhorn um was a church that had a serious lack of understanding of its history Mm -hmm. and um it it so the church in Elkhorn, prior to my getting there 25 years ago in 1996, um, had gone through two church splits, um, and they had um, 
They had hired two pastors in a row, and each of the pastors had come in with great fanfare, and then um, half the church loved them and half the church hated them. Mm -hmm. And the, when the pastor was finally asked to leave, they took a good chunk of the congregation with them and started their own churches. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I couldn't understand when I first got to Elkhorn was how could they, how could they hire these guys? Right. Um, especially the second guy um, was somebody who had gone to a different theological seminary in a different tradition. Uh, he was a Baptist, so he didn't believe in infant baptism. Um, he was against women mm -hmm. in leadership positions in the church. He was certainly against LGBTQ people and mm -hmm. acceptance in the congregation. Um, and uh, it was just surprising that a UCC church would hire somebody who was so different from everything mm -hmm. that was what I thought was important about being a congregational UCC church. And what I found out was that they didn't really understand who they were. Mm. So, so when they hired him, they, he, he would, he would do things like he would, he would point to a, 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 a part of the Bible that says women shouldn't be in leadership positions. You know, women should be silent in church. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, well, if the, if the Bible says this, why are you guys doing, mm -hmm. why are you guys allowing women to have, uh, you know, positions of leadership? Why are you, um, the Bible says this about gay and lesbian people. Why are you, why are you allowing them or thinking that it's okay to have them in the church? Mm -hmm. Um, the church, the Bible says this about, uh, you know, when Jesus uh, blessed the children, he didn't baptize the children. So why are you doing infant baptisms? Oh. And the members of the church at that time, they didn't have any, they, they had no ammunition right. to kind of say like, well, but this is a part of who we are as a congregational church. This is who we are as part of a Christian church that goes back in the tradition and goes has a whole history of its own and a development and a theology and a, a whole pattern of way of being the church. Um, yeah. And so, so for me, when I started to lead the Elkhorn Church, I kind of wanted to give them the ammunition that mm -hmm. they needed to resist right. a new pastor coming in and right. saying, you need to do this. Right. They could have like the ammunition to say like, but that's not who we are. That's right. not who we are as a congregation, as a church, as a tradition. Right. Um, and so in order to help them, I started talking a lot more about history. And the more I talked about history, the more I, you know, I they really... They pretended to be interested they... in it. <laughs> they did. They, they were good sports Ooh. about it. They were good sports about the yeah. whole thing. But, uh, but, but I think that, that history is important for those reasons. Like, why are we like this and not like that? Right. Um, well... The, the reason is there's this whole history of tradition. There's a whole history of interpretation. There's a whole history of, of learning how to be the church in particular time periods mm -hmm. that we've found important and meaningful. Um, and, and it's fascinating for me. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I've learned in my racial justice work is that a lot of our history that we were taught was good. You know, we're mm. sort of the heroes of our history, uh, particularly in our congregational tradition, was not good. Right. And so, you know, we were we were colonizers. Mm -hmm. And um, our faith tradition used that to enslave and or take the land from and to take advantage of all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. um, how do you reconcile... Like, you know, you know, they saying that those who don't understand their history are doomed to repeat it. You know, mm -hmm. um, how how important is knowing the bad parts? I mean, we went to a congregational UCC congregational seminary mm -hmm. and we were steeped in the congregational, you know, and I really felt like, why would anybody want to be anything but a congregationalist? Right. We're awesome. We never talked about that right. stuff. And that wasn't like. A hundred years ago, it feels like a hundred mm -hmm. years ago, but it wasn't. So, how is that? Where does the the um, getting at the true history as opposed to the celebrated history? Right. Well, the, 
it's always it's a struggle Mm -hmm. it's a struggle and because um people naturally it's for instance uh in my own family history my dad loves to tell a story about one of his uncles doing a um a history of the mcleod family and uh, he was interested and excited about doing it until he found one of our ancestors hanging from a tree (laughs) for stealing horses And so as soon as he found that out, he didn't want to know anymore. Right. And so decided, well, it's best not to, you know. And so there, there is a certain amount of that, I think, in history in mm. that it's, it's much more pleasant to remember the good stuff that your right. ancestors have done than the bad stuff. Right. Um, at the same time, there's always, um, there's always trying to understand, for instance, um, it's, it's, you know, our ancestors in faith were not, you know, they would not have accepted women's ordination. Right. You know, so how do you read, you know, some of these, um, these, these folks that were, you know, very faithful, very trying to, to figure out their faith and their understanding, um, but certainly would not be in agreement with us today. Right. Right. So how do you piece together the things that they, that they were really good at with the things that we, we believe right now that they, they got them pretty wrong, right? You know, right. So there's always there's always a process of of trying to resort through that stuff, mm-hmm. um, and it's difficult sometimes to read, uh, you know, like a Lyman Beecher, um, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe's like grandfather, you mm-hmm. know, and know that he was probably pretty misogynistic, mm-hmm. you know. But how do you, you know, is it possible to redeem some of his writing, even though he was probably not a really Mm -hmm. like somebody in today's world would like we probably wouldn't like him very much right right so so there there's always a little bit of that um but but part of the history is again trying to figure that out like if it weren't for some of the black authors today going back through and sorting through some of that stuff we wouldn't know they wouldn't have the the strength of the tradition to rely on as they move forward. Right. You, you know what I mean? I, so, I mean, it, yeah. but, but it is, it's, it's difficult to uh, figure out. Um, and part, part of it is, that, and, and this is a good thing about history, I think, is that we're all trapped in our own present. Right. You know, so in a hundred years, there are going to be people who look back at the, the most enlightened um, Christian writers that we have today. The ones that we think are like, man, they are like cutting mm-hmm. edge, doing incredible work. Right reclaiming all this stuff that in the past that we didn't have quite right you know we're at the peak of our understanding of what christianity is all about a hundred years from now people are going to look back on this time and go like man were they (laughs) they were dumb they were really they really (laughs) had it wrong about this stuff you know so there is a there is a kind of humility about understanding where we are now and knowing that you know, even though we think that we've got it all together, the fact that we can look back on the past and say they did not have it all figured out, even though they thought they right. had it all figured right. out. Right. Um, so I, I think that that's that can mm. be a, a good perspective. So you're very uh, steeped in our congregational history and the major players in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things I'm learning in my racial justice work is. Um, you know, reading the gospel, reading the Bible from the margins Mm -hmm. and um, looking at um, other um, interpretations of scripture that don't come out of the colonizing, um, you know, um, white um, established uh, perspective um, with the argument that um, Jesus well, and, and actually the Old Testament, too, was, you know, that it is the history of um, the losers, not the winners. Mm. And so, uh, and the people on the margins. And so, how do you do history that way when so much of history is written by the winners right. and the colonizers and straight yeah, white men <laughs> again it's well again it's it is a struggle um and part of it is to again some like uh like john robinson right you know uh the the pastor to the pilgrims remember that he was somebody who was on the margins 
mm-hmm. when he when he wrote to the pilgrims, you know, that God has yet more light and truth to bring forth from right. His holy word. So now go take people's lands. <laughs> well, but but again, they 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 saw themselves, and again, just like we do today, we have certain assumptions about our rightness. Right. Don't we. I mean, right. every Sunday, you and I get up in front of people right. and right. have the audacity to assume yeah. that we know what we're talking about when right. we're interpreting scripture. Right. It's the same presumption that they had that they could come into a place that they right. knew better. Right. I mean, they really, they all had the assumption that they knew right. better. Right. And so if uh, they found people acting in different ways, they really didn't know. Oh, that's wrong. You right. know, it's right. You know, hey, I, I grew up in that, I grew up in that family. <laughs> right. Right. You know, I grew up in that family. If someone does something different from the way that we do it, well, that's just wrong. Right. You know, it's not yeah. just different or just a different way of doing things. Right. It's, you know. It's wrong. It's wrong. They're not that bad. <laughs> uh, they but, just, yeah. But, but I do, you know, but it, but it is always a, you know, again, even the, the, the history that you think is kind of settled fact, mm-hmm. it is amazing to read reinterpretations of it. Like even some of the the authors that we read mm-hmm. when we were going through seminary, there are new historians. Or pretended to read. Or... <laughs> Let me just can I just tell you, <laughs> rapping with Laura. Laura and I were in several classes together. I would read everything, everything on the syllabus, uh, all the reading assignments. I would read everything. Laura would go to class. It would come to the end of the semester and writing a paper. Laura would get a better grade just having gone to class and listening to people talk and everything than I reading everything. So, um, it's called BS. <laughs> and I'm soups good at it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, but, um, yeah, yeah sorry. But, but, but all, all I'm saying is that, uh, uh, that, that there are newer interpretations of that same time period. Right. And again, uh, but but looking at that source material and asking the source material different questions, right? Then we're right. being asked right. by the people that we read thirty years ago, right? And it, but but again, it's fascinating. Yeah. I, I mean, I just find it just uh, just really interesting um, uh, to rediscover that. We stuff. have to wrap up in a couple minutes because I don't want people falling asleep. No, I know. <laughs> no, but. You have notes. What else would you like to share with us? Um, so I, there are a couple things. One is that I, I find history comforting, not only because it's a little bit of an escapism for me, because I know how it turns out. Right. You know, right. you don't have to be nervous about the Civil War. You know that the North won the, the Civil War. Right. You know. Unless um, you live in the South. Right. But I mean, even in the South, <laughs> you, you, know, you, know I know. What I, you know what I mean. I know. Um, so it is a little bit of an escapism for me, but um, but it does, it's also a good reminder that the church, especially like church history, that the church has been through times when it has been sidelined. The church has been through times in which it was incredibly scandalized even mm-hmm. more than it is today. Mm-hmm. And the church has still come through it. Right. You know, and that is of comfort to me. Um, there are also things about uh, particular people um, mm-hmm. Like Jonathan Edwards is a congregational minister from the colonial times. Um, and he, he's, he's, you know, supposed to be like one of the greatest American theologians and greatest American philosophers. He was fired from his church because the people were upset with him because he wanted the parents to control their young men. He was upset <laughs> because the young men of town got drunk or something and he wanted to... Uh, he blamed the parents. He, he wanted them to control their young men. And the parents were embarrassed by kind of being called out. Uh-huh. And so they canned him <laughs> and kicked him yeah. out. You know, so it's it's kind of, it's one of those things that, like, even Jonathan Edwards, like the greatest American theologian and greatest American philosopher, you know, he still got fired by his right. congregation. You right. know, it's like some of these things are yeah. are still... still. And... And let me just one last thing. Go, go for it. Um, and again, it's also why history has been uh, is fascinating to me. Is is you know one of my favorite theologians is Reinhold Niebuhr, and love your Laura, Niebuhr. Yeah, <laughs> and Laura, 
uh, we were listening together, the, the Cross and the Lynching Tree yeah. by James Cone, right? Yep. And in that book, it points out that Niebuhr, who wrote this great, this great two-volume work on the nature and destiny of man, and, and, and Niebuhr was very, very big on how, um, you know, individuals can be kind of moral, but that societies at large are, tend to be immoral. Mm -hmm. um, and Cohn points out that in all Niebuhr's talk about uh, evil and sinfulness and structural uh, injustice, he never talked about racism. Mm hmm and and it's just you know again it's it's one of those things for me as a as somebody who likes history and like you know uh it just that that someone like Niebuhr who was who was brilliant mm -hmm. had such a blind spot about something that was just so obvious right to everybody again it's one of those things that i think is it 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 makes me look at Niebuhr differently now mm -hmm. Makes me look at James Cone differently. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You see how brilliant he he is. Yeah. Um, but it it also it also again makes me humble about like, and wondering where where are my blind spots? Right, right. What are we blind to mm -hmm. right now that we're just not? Right. Um, right. So. Well done, Professor. <laughs> Thank you for being guest number three on the interview sessions of Rapping with Reverend Laura. Uh, I'm going to be widening the circle now, so watch out. I'm uh -oh. coming for you. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much, Scott McLeod. Appreciate your time. Reverend Doctor. You're, you're very Excellent. welcome. Excellent. <laughs>